Thank you, darling. Well, come on. Don't start the clock yet. Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. There we go. All right, hi. Woo. Hello. Soak it in, everybody. This is me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, stand up in the back. You don't want to miss this shit. <laughs> I'm a bit different, so, you know, I, I am. I know I'm different, too. I'm Canadian. In fact, I was born in Thompson, Manitoba, Canada. Very small town up in northern Manitoba. Uh, so small, like not a lot of medical advancements in 1970. So when I was born, the doctor that delivered me was also the butcher, and he was the head coach of the hockey team. Of course, when I popped up, they weren't ready for me. It was 32 hours of labor, and then I came out, and the doctor was like, oh gosh, I don't think she's gonna make it through the night. I did. They're like, she's not gonna make it through the week. I did. My entire life, people have been, you know, basically underestimating me, and they have no idea that I am Tanya Lee, unstoppable me. And here's me as a kid. I was, people expected me to be a real small child. I have a form of dwarfism called diastrophic dysplasia. It's, uh, it means basically it's a recessive gene. Both my parents carried it. All diastrophic dwarfs have normal-sized parents. But as you can tell, I had a gigantic head. Look at that. You can see why my mother, after 32 hours of labor, still resents me. Apparently, I ruined her lady garden. Ah. And as I grew up, my, with my type of dwarfism, we actually, it's very deceptive because from my shoulders to my bum, I'm actually the same height as most of you. It's only my arms and my legs that are short. So it's quite deceptive. And, uh, you know, clearly my fashion sense has improved. Uh, thank goodness for that. But I was your average kid. I went to a normal school. I did everything I could possibly do. I played sports, everything. Thing is, is I didn't know I was different until I started school and kids started to tell me that I was different. I heard, oh God, look at the midget. I was like, what's that? What's a midget? All, I, all the time, midget, midget, midget. People ask me why the term midget is considered quite offensive. It's because growing up, you have no identity other than being the midget. Hey, look, there's a midget. Don't look now, there's a midget. You know? So it basically, we have to claim our own identity. And, but as a young child, I was always very adventurous. I, I got involved in anything I po possibly could do. Played tons of sports. And I just sort of always had this outgoing personality. And I always tried out for productions, uh, school productions. But I never could get the lead. I was always a, a, you know, a shrub in the background. The nativity scene, I was a sheep. I had one line. <laughs> Nailed it. You know? But I wanted to be the star. And in the seventh grade, uh, the elementary school uh, from kindergarten to grade six, they were doing a Christmas production and they needed one of the older kids to narrate. And I, this was my shot. And I got it. That was my first time in the limelight. And I was like, all right, the spark has been ignited, people. Back up. So I really had that theatrical bug. But my family was like, listen, you need to go to university. You need to get an education. So. I decided, oh fine, I'll go to university, I'll study theater. Ah, oh, the problem is, is when you go to university, you actually have to study theater. And I'm like, I just want to perform. So I ended up with a sociology and criminology degree. But while I was doing my university degree, I started doing children's theater. And I'm pleased to say I got the lead production, lead role in the Christmas production called Let's Hear It for Christmas. I was Perry the Penguin. Thank you, typecasting at its finest. I started dating a guy in the production. He played the villain, and apparently he had a thing for penguins. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. So one night he said to me, I'm going down to a comedy club to do an open mic night. Do you want to come join me? I'd never been to a comedy club before. Never aspired to be a comedian. I didn't know what it was about. So there I was, I was at the back of the room watching this guy on stage, and he was shit. I don't know what he was doing wrong, but instinctively, I just knew what he was doing wrong. I got very excited. I was like, oh my God, you just get up and perform. That's what I want to do. So when he got off stage, and he was like, Ugh, and I was like, hey, you are terrible. And he's like, oh, thanks. And he goes, you think you can do better? I said, I'm going to give it a shot. So he got me the comedy book, started writing some material. Three weeks into it, uh, I did quite well. Three months into doing comedy, I started getting paid. Awesome. Four months into it, this guy goes and dumps me. Yeah. Apparently, he started dating a seal. <sighs> Just my luck. But I've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and I get to travel all around the world. But there's three things in my life that have improved my independence greatly. The first one is my mobility scooter. 
I, I mean, I have short legs, short arms. I played tons of sports growing up, but I developed arthritis at a young age. So the doctors actually decided they wanted to do surgery on me. And what they planned on doing, the doctor said, we're going to break all the bones from your waist down, and we're going to reconstruct you. Yay. <laughs> they said, no, 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 don't worry. You'll get two to three inches of height. Yay. You know what? Two to three inches is great if you're a penis. <laughs> Not really gonna change my life drastically. It's like, oh great, I can finally see over the counter the stuff I can't reach. <laughs> so they said, get a mobility scooter. And of course I was in high school at the time and my pride got in the way and I didn't want one because I'd be the midget on a scooter. But once I started university, I needed to get to my classes. And that opened my world. And I've been to many, many countries all over the world. Look at this, this is the only picture you will see of me doing dishes, by the way. <laughs> Just so you know. Uh, but I've been to Venice, Malta, that's uh, San Tropez there. Uh, been all over. And I currently live in England, which is one of the most non-accessible places. Uh, the thing is, is, a lot of it has to do with attitude, uh, getting around. And it's very difficult with the mobility scooter, because in the UK, it's not considered a wheelchair. So I run into problems all the time. And the problem in the United Kingdom is they're just not really forthcoming. They're very restricted on what they can do. They're like, well, sorry, I can't help you. It's against health and safety. You know, what happened to human kindness? Like, for example, Cyprus, you need to work on your accessibility, by the way. Uh, uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm going to give you credit, though, because you do make an attempt. Like, all the sidewalks, many of them are curbed, right, to the street. But you get up on the other side, and half the pavement's missing. <laughs> I've even seen some places where there's a shop that has a ramp that goes up two steps. The problem is, is there are four steps. <laughs> the ramp only goes up the first two steps. What's going on? <laughs> anyway, I believe it's attitude. People at least want to help. Like, for example, when I was in living in London, or I wasn't living in London, I was in London. I was by the London Eye, tourist place, Mecca. And all these people wandering around. I was driving along, looking up, and I drove over the curb by accident. I tipped my mobility scooter over. And I'm lying on the ground. Not one person stopped to ask if I was OK. Now, one person asked if I needed any help. I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, two days ago, when I came out of my hotel, I came around the corner, the front wheel of my scooter got caught in a rut, and I was literally stuck. Out of nowhere, this Cyprian woman, built like a brick shit house, some of you ladies, whoo, she just comes out of nowhere and grabs the front of my scooter, and I was like, whoa! And then she was like, pats me on the back, on you go. <laughs> awesome! I got caught trying to get on the pavement. There was construction. So I had this old man was coming towards me and he was like, you, you know, he was motioning like, I'll help you get through. And I'm like, it's not wide enough. So I'm going to have to cross the street. This gentleman was probably about 90 years old. He just stepped out in traffic, just bounced out and like, oh, no, we're coming through, coming through. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is awesome. Because I realize a lot of disabled people will say, you know, having a positive attitude is great, but having a positive attitude doesn't change stairs to a ramp. But the thing, I mean, and I get that. I'm lucky because I'm not sort of uh, use my mobility all the time, a mobility scooter all the time. I can't get off and walk. Uh, but for me, it's attitude. Uh, you know, like taxi drivers in London, they have accessible taxis, but I can't get one because I have to hide around a bus bench, get somebody else to flag a taxi, and then I come zip it out, and they go, ugh, shit. <laughs> you know, but here, it doesn't matter. You know, a lot of taxis aren't accessible. What can we do to help? And I love that attitude. And the, like many countries, I've been to the Philippines, they carried my mobility scooter over the sand. It was amazing. And you know, that's what it's all about, is having a positive attitude and believing what you can. Because my entire life, I just believe I can do things. So don't tell me I can't, because it pisses me off. <laughs> So the other big thing in my life that's changed is step stools. I know that seems odd, but when you're my size, step stools are amazing. I mean, I use them to my vanity, I sit to get up onto the bed, you know, get up on the toilet, thank goodness. Uh, and the thing is, back in the day when I first started doing stand-up comedy, I used to stand on a chair. And I would lean against the back of the chair to take the pressure off my back, but sometimes I'm performing 45 minutes to an hour and I'd get so tired and start sweating. And unfortunately, because my hips are quite arthritic now, um, I'm not moving as well. So I decided, that's it, I'm going to start sitting on a step stool on stage. And you know what? I love it. 
because I got freedom. I can use my entire body, and I, even though I'm small, I basically try to use uh, the best of my physical ability on stage, and that really sort of transformed my act. Plus, the sticks, you have no, or the step stools are fantastic. I mean, I can reach things that I've never been able to reach for before as well. The third thing that has changed my life is a stick, a simple stick. Here it is, right here. Yes, this stick has changed my life. How I came about was my mother had a 1972 Chevy Nova. And back in the day, they did not have electronic door locks. So the Automobile Association had a wooden stick in the car that if you were in the driver's seat, you could reach across and pop up the door lock. Well, I found it in my mother's car, and I took it into the house. Next thing you know, I'm turning on light switches. Bang, my parents were thinking they were having a stroke or something because the light switches were gone and off, on and off, on and off. I'm like, this is amazing. So I started carrying one with me, and I used it for elevator buttons. But more importantly, like getting dressed, putting on my socks, because, because my hips are getting worse, I can't reach the bottom of my feet. So getting my socks on, even more importantly, getting my pants down. When you have an ass like a Kardashian <laughs> and short arms like a T-Rex, it's very, very difficult. So I got this stick and I basically started using it to push my pants down and pull them up when I go to the washroom. And it made my life, transform my life because as a child I was too embarrassed to ask for help. So I had accidents quite a bit when I was younger. But now I carry this stick wherever I go. So if anybody wants a spanking later, <laughs> woo, I gotcha. <laughs> the cue starts here. So that's the thing is, disabled people are very resilient. We come up with things, we have a wide imagination because that's, you know, for like little people, we grow up in a big people's world. So we have to adapt. My parents, both tall, had no idea what I was in store for, so they didn't have a clue. They said basically, here is how we hold a pen. Here you go, figure it out yourself because my hands are quite different than theirs, right? So I would hold a pen and, and I started writing. It was just basically, you try it, you figure out your way to do things, and that's what I've done my entire life. And I've been living in the UK now, and I've luckily fortunate enough to get on some TV shows, but being in the entertainment business is quite difficult because you're in a business and you're being constantly told no, as a female comedian as well, and then obviously as a disabled comedian, that just layers it all up. I've had bookers tell me that they didn't want to book me. Uh, I had one booker say to me, I booked somebody with cerebral palsy who had a speech impediment. They didn't go over so well, so we don't think that they're going to like you. I'm like, wait a second, that's like comparing pineapples and jet fuel. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And that's the sort of what I'm running into now. There's some shows in the UK where comedians do tasks. And I'm like, how come I'm not on that show? And they're like, we're not really sure if you can handle doing the tasks. I'm like, but why don't you give me the option? Unless the task is getting on British transport, <laughs> I've got this nailed. <laughs> so that's it. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do. And I'm very determined, and I have a very wide imagination, and I will figure out things myself. And the thing is, is that's it. When you see somebody with a disability, don't feel sorry for them. I get that all the time. Oh, it must be so difficult. Life is difficult for everybody. You just have to find your own way of doing things. And that's what we do. We adapt. I don't know any different. I figured this out. I'm, you're all going to become disabled. I'm ahead of the curve here, people. <laughs> that's it. I'm functioning quite fine. <laughs> But it's been an amazing experience. I've had a great career. I, work, I live in England now, and I'm on, a, uh, on the board of directors of an anti-bullying campaign, so I work in schools trying to empower kids and uh, show them that anything is possible, uh, which is great. I also, because of all my trials and tribulations with British transport, I am also uh, heading up the Scooter Girl campaign, so I'm advocating a lot for people with disabilities in the United Kingdom. But, like I said, it's all about attitude, and if people at least make an attempt Make an attempt to, you know, the accessibility is not there, but just be kind, be willing to help. You know, that's what we need to do in society. And the thing is, is no matter how small you think you are, if you believe in yourself, you can cast a big enough shadow to change the world. And I am Tanya Lee, and I am an unstoppable me. Thank you. <laughs>